Hey, how's everybody doing? I was uh, trying to do a video a few days ago looking for a uh, species of Liatris, Liatris nova anglii, uh, and it's been so uh, toasty uh, and uh, <laughs> so toasty and uh, dry that it unfortunately wasn't really going off. So I'm out here in a different habitat. Uh, looking for another species, another aster, actually another Eupatoriae aster, so in the tribe Eupatoriae, also with the species epithet Nova Anglii, but instead of Liatris Nova Anglii, we are looking for a less showy, but actually more rare, a true endemic uh, species of Eupatorium, Eupatorium Nova Anglii, and uh, if you've ever heard of uh, a bone set or thoroughwort, that's, uh, that's Eupatorium. Of course, most people when referring to um, referring to those plants, are usually referring to the plant Eupatorium perfoliatum, the uh, uh, perfoliate leaf bonewort or common bonewort, whatever you want to call it. But um, that's not where we are today. In fact, we're on the uh, actually down near Cape Cod, uh, only uh, you know within basically essentially pissing distance of where the uh, you know pilgrims washed ashore back then. What was it the 1500s? Uh, you know, not too far from that location. Ironically, in a patch of forest that uh, contains uh, quite a bit of old growth in it, um, this has been either private land or set aside to be reserved for, for quite a number of decades, uh, if not centuries. I had to go back and reread about it. But uh, regardless, this is a quite a cool habitat. We're going down into um, an area that's a little bit different from what we saw last time we were on Cape Cod. Of course, Cape Cod, of course, you remember last time we were down there on the uh, outer Cape where it's uh, a bit dry, a bit sandy, a bit warm. Um, you know, they had cacti growing out there, junipers, um, all sorts of stuff that you see normally in, you know, habitats that are much drier than uh, you typically associate with New England. But here we're going down into a type of habitat called a, uh, you know, a Cape Cod uh, gravel pond. All right. So essentially you have that kettle holing like you get uh, northeast of here uh, in those uh you know, peat bogs, peat fens, uh, but this is a little bit different. Uh, there's a little bit less peat accumulation, um, gravel instead of uh, sphagnum, and a lot of them, because remember we're essentially standing on a mountain of glacial till, uh, and it's kind of a unique habitat. There's a couple of plants that are going to be growing one, the Eupatorium nova anglii should theoretically be in bloom. Maybe we'll get to see this rare gentian. The gentian is extremely rare as well. Not technically endemic to New England. Grows in a few locations around the world. Or not around the world. Grows in three specific locations down the East Coast. Nova Scotia, Massachusetts, which just happens to be its most robust population. And the population from which it drives its common name, the Plymouth gentian. Um, and then also grows uh, uh, down in North Carolina weirdly enough. Uh, but this plant right in front of me, where we're going to start out with here, we get Clethra ulnifolia. Uh, just wrapping up for the season, the uh, pepper bush. And now that it's kind of been blooming for quite a while, I, I guess those kind of look like pepper pods. Of course, no relation to pepper at all. This is in the uh, family Clethraceae in the order Ericales. So absolutely no relation to, um, to, uh, what is that? Piper alleys, Piper ACA is what pepper's in. Uh, being pollinated by bees and wasps. Uh, so I'm going to quit yammering on. Uh, you also get a nice uh, nice thicket of milkweed over there, but unless we're seeing Asclepius incarnata, that all looks like Syriac, which is done. Maybe we'll see some Asclepius incarnata. We saw that when we were you know further down the Cape a few weeks ago, but it was just getting started. I digress. Uh, so a few Cool plants we're hoping to see today. I'm just going to take a picture of this clutter right here. Make sure that's logged. Because this is a nice plant. And, uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Oh, yeah. You guys know how much I love Comptonia peregrina coming up here with the regular fern. Kind of got confused. I saw the, I saw Comptonia, you know, from a little distance away. And I was like, oh, geez. And then I walk up and there's actually a fern here right in front of any sorry on that fern. Always got to look for the, always got to look for the sorry. Although I'm not seeing any on this guy. But Comptonia, again, I talked about this in the time. Smells delightful. Not a fern at all. 
member of the uh, oak order Figales, and in the family Miracaceae, uh, the wax myrtle family. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many other species in Miracaceae grow out here in New England, but um, Comptonia peregrina, this plant here, is the uh, sole species in its genus. Kind of a weird one, and then doing exactly what you expect it to do. All right, they got a little clearing in this trail here. Coming up right there, coming up right here. Just, you know, uh, was there a little bit behind me? Not really. Just kind of comes up in clearings. Woodland clearings is what it likes. Can take the super dry, can take the super um, hot sun. Um, even in the drought, the spots I've seen this growing recently, it, it gets a little red, but uh, otherwise is doing just fine, a little drought stressed. But uh, I've been hoping to see one with the fruits on it. Because again, you know, it's a flowering plant. It's not, not a fern at all. So it does flower. It does get fruits. Um, really inconspicuous flowers. And the fruit almost looks a little bit like a burr. But uh, I'm not I'm not seeing it here. Just an expert at um, laying in wait in that soil seed bank down there. So this thing will put out seeds every year. And it'll just sit and wait and wait and wait. And then you get a, you know, a fire comes through. Or um, man-made disturbance comes through in this case, and it just pops right back up from the uh, from the soil seed bank, uh, none the worse for wear, and ready to um, essentially pioneer its uh, pioneer its new habitat. Here's here's some with some new growth on it. It's got that tender growth there. Oh, that smells really good. The new growth it it just smells like mint. It smells like a it's like sweet mint, but almost better because uh, sweet mint doesn't always smell that good when you pick it fresh, but you know, we've talked about Comptonia plenty. There's another guy right here. Talked about Comptonia plenty. No need to harp on that for right now. Okay, here's one we've seen plenty of times, but uh, never been able to get up close. Look at the bee in there. Look at him just going ballistic. Oh, oh, no, 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 to come near me, fella. Here, go pollinate that one. Go pollinate it. Good job. Look at all those anthers in there. So this is uh, Nymphaea odorata. This is the uh, white water lily. Of course, no relation to lilies at all. It's in the family Nymphaceae. Um, I always forget the order. That is, is it Miss Nymphales? It doesn't matter. I don't think it's Nymphales. Nymphaceae is the family. Um, Nymphaea odorata, most importantly, is the plant. Numerous white uh, tepals. Remember, tepals just means that we're not distinguishing between the, um, the sepals and the um, petals. Um, because we can't, because there is no distinction. And in fact, uh, those petals, or tepals, I should say, gradually uh, change into the shape of those anthers in there. And just numerous, numerous anthers in there. These are uh, basal angiosperms, basically just meaning that these were some of the first flowering plants to uh, you know, break off from the rest of them. Um, uh, you know, these have been been around in a relatively unchanged form factor for quite a while. Um, I don't remember. I think they technically predate, you know, having to differentiate between dicot and monocot. I, I don't know what the cotyledons of these come up uh, with. Um, famous lily pads convergent amongst, um, you know, a number of different uh, unrelated plant lineages. You, you obviously have Nufar variegata, um, the yellow pond lily, uh, making these, which is in the same family. That's also in Nymphaceae, different genus, same family, Nymphaceae. Then you also have um, the lotuses, as they're called, uh, Nelumbo, uh, Nelumbaceae, um, doing this as well. Um, just uh, doing the whole pad thing, although I think they're pads, whereas these are flat. I think a lot of the um, the uh, lotus pads, as they're called, Nelumbo, I think they get those ridges around. I I've seen it before. I should know. Oh, Jesus. I'm scaring the frogs. Um, the frogs were all chirping, getting mad at me. Uh, you got a species of Sagittaria here. I saw one over there that I was planning to show you, but uh, it's, I think it's just Sagittaria. Um, I always forget the latifolia. Same one we see often. It's a nice plant, uh, Elise Metales, or Elise Metaceae. Elise Metales is the order. Elise Metaceae is the um, is the family here. Uh, I was at a loss last time I was talking about it, um, but that's actually the same family as the um, wild ginger. Is it wild ginger? The uh, Asterum canadense. A lot of people are really into that plant. This is the same family as that, and it's also got the uh, the three petals going on there. 
Those are the fruits. They get the little cockles on them. Little spines don't hurt, just probably for grabbing onto the fur. And um, yeah, we've interesting little habitat here. I have a hunch, some ancient piece of machinery right there that I've no clue what it did. Just looks like it's been here for maybe 150 years or whatever. Um, this looks like it's typically a lot more um, filled in. Uh, oh yeah, there's some more Sagittaria, and the fact that Sagittaria is growing all the way up over there probably tells me that this is filled up closer to the shore there, typically. But again, it's been so hot and so dry. Uh, however, that has afforded me access to finally see um, that beautiful Nymphaea odorata there, which we have seen uh, oh too many times, um, unable to get close to it. Um, I've actually found one of our target plants that that gentian is over there. It sticks out like a like a bright pink billboard uh, Incredibly hard to miss. So we're gonna go look at that in a minute I'm taking a few pictures making a few posts on INAT and then we will move on I've been I've actually been hanging out over here for like a half hour now. This is a cool little area to come down to um, I, I would worry about walking through, you know wetland, but this is I mean, it's kind of marshy right here, but you, you step over here, it's just bone dry and there's nothing coming up but grass. Uh, ordinarily, I'd probably discourage you from doing that, number one, because you could sink through it. And number two, a lot of these plants, um, you know, it's a somewhat sensitive habit, but uh, this appears to be either some sort of remnant from a man-made drainage. Oh, there's more of that uh, gentian right there. Can you see that? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go look at that guy in just a second. I'm almost done here. Let me do a couple things and I'll go show you. That's a that's a beautiful plant. We'll go look at that right now. Okay, well here we have one of our target plants for today. This is Sabatia Kennediana, named after the uh, Kennedys. I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true or not. Maybe it was discovered by a guy named Kennedy. But in any case, as a very Massachusetts name and it's a very Massachusetts plant. Um, this is uh, in the family Gentianaceae, so gentian. A lot of uh, closed um, closed flowers in this family. Uh, Cleistogamous, I think is the word for that. So the flowers never open up, ensuring um, self-pollination. This is obviously not the case with this flower. This guy is uh, open, bright, and proud. And let's let's zoom in. Let's see what we got going on there. Look at that. That's not a uh, inner... You know, these aren't pink sepals. There's a guy right there, a little spider. These aren't um, pink sepals with a, uh, you know, array of yellow petals in there. Th that's just the color of the petals, which is incredibly striking to me. Uh, how many anthers you got in there? I think they should have about eight. One, two, three, four. A few more than eight, actually. I can't count. Uh, got a weird little um, two-tendrilled stigma there that kind of just flops down. Here's another flower. It's flopping down there. Nine anthers, huh? I don't know if that's a snapomorphia for the gentian AC. I don't know much about gentians. Let's see this guy. Does this guy have a little less? Maybe they broke off. So you're looking at seven, seven on this one, nine on that one, uh, and the petal number is inconsistent too. Um, you know, you get more than seven petals there. I wonder if it's just now because you get more than nine petals. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Whatever. You get the idea. Flip this guy over. We got a nice calyx. Just a nice lacy calyx. Leaves are opposite. Spreads from the nodes. Looks like one flower got snipped. And then I believe these also have a basal rosette. Maybe not this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here it is. See? Get those basal leaves down at the bottom. Apparently it's evergreen. So you can still see these. Uh, people talk about seeing them through ice. Here are some of the uh, flowers that haven't quite opened yet. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that bud, how they swirl around there. That's super cool, huh? Here's one that's finishing up. There's that fruit. Calyx stays on and persists. And again, a plant um, only really known from a few areas. Uh, very, very robust population here in Massachusetts, um, down on the, uh, what you would call the, I guess, inner cape. Um, Known from like these, uh, this type, this exact type of habitat, kind of like a coastal, not not really boggy. I can't really call this a bog. Um, more of just like a a wetland, like a pond shore. There's a big pond behind me over there. 
Uh, and I think that maybe at one point this was just like a some sort of water. I don't know what they were doing here. Looks like there was an old um, dam here at one point. Maybe that has something to do with that piece of machinery down there. I saw quite a few more down around the corner here. And actually, that I was over there looking at the water lilies. I walked down along the opposite shore here. None of them grown on the opposite shore. Only on this side where presumably they're getting enough sun to do their thing. Not growing down where it gets really damp. Kind of just right on the edge. And I saw some more on the other side of this bridge here. Um, all in full bloom. All seemingly doing very, very well for themselves. Um, Sabatia kennediana. Just a beautiful, striking flower. And I said this before, but known from Massachusetts. I think they got a population in Nova Scotia. Uh, allegedly, this makes it down into Rhode Island, too. And in the same... I mean, we're not far from Rhode Island here. I mean, Rhode Island, you could drive for 40 minutes. So if it sounds like that's a lot of habitat. Really, it's not. It's just a continuous area, essentially from the base of Cape Cod over to Rhode Island. Geographically speaking, the area is, is identical. Oh, oh, I mean, it's scary. It has a bumblebee trying to visit the dead one, but there's plenty of good ones here. Um, geez, I, I don't want to ramble. I don't want to info dump too much on you. A gentian, again, gentianaceae, there's other plants in this uh, family here, but I mean, this is kind of the cream of the crop. I mean beautiful showy flower uh limited distribution it's got a cool ecology it's one of those evergreen plants that you know you'll see it pop out in winter on a warm day with those basal rosettes they're visible under ice I i'm in love with that little floppy those little floppy stigmas there stigma style i guess you could say is that the stick i guess you could say that that's the that's technically the floppy style so two styles going down into that capsule and then again that's what that come here that's what that fruit looks like once it matures. Um, yeah, down in the Carolinas too, allegedly up into Virginia. But this is the most stable and robust population of it. Hanging out on the glacial, glacially formed pond shores of Cape Cod. Um, presumably, maybe it had a much larger distribution at one point. Doesn't get anywhere inland at all. Uh, it hangs out basically right here down at sea level. Uh, and just, yeah, that's, that's a really... Really beautiful gentian. Uh, apparently also in cultivation. Not of this population. I think they've got that um, Carolinas population, which I think might cover a broader area, but just be more um, sparse. You also get something I thought was a goldenrod at first. I thought this was Solidago, but it's not. It actually was actually, to my credit, was in Solidago at one time. This is Euthamia Carolinians, or Euthamia Caroliniana, I think is actually it. Get up in there. And I mean, you could see how that could be confused for a solid doggo. You know, it was once a solid doggo, now in Euthamia. The seaside grass-leaved flat top, golden flat top. Uh, it looks like we've got, um, uh, not, not pistols, uh, stigma, not a stigma style. Over. What am I, what am I trying to say here? Looks like we've got our, our stamens out there now. Um, and if I could really zoom in there. Again, Asteraceae is a family on this, if I didn't say that already. You can kind of make out those little individual florets there. You know, see how it gets the name grass-leaved. Just got the thin, kind of sparse uh, grass-like leaves. Op alternate, of course. And, uh, again, sharing this type of habitat. A much more common common and widespread plant, but get a lot of this down, down the East Coast um, from what I just read. But a nice one, you know. I always like anything Saldago or Saldago adjacent. Of course, that's a Euthamia, like I said. Asteraceae is the family, of course, which you should know. If you've been watching any of the videos where I've talked about them, or if you just know, you know a thing or two about plants. It's the sunflower family, etc. Uh, I mean, I'm seeing lots of this everywhere, so I'm hoping to come across it again. I've just spent the better part of an hour just... Uh, hanging out in this habitat here but uh, like i said we have an endemic plant that we're going to go see so let's uh, do that so that's where we just were down there and when i say gravelly pond shores what i'm talking about is this this stuff right here i mean you can just see there's nothing to that it's all just sand so even though there was you know some organic matter kind of making it a little bit peaty there rest assured we're on that cape cod sandy gravel uh glacially deposited stuff uh, which is influencing, I mean, you do get some white pines, but the uh, pitch pines, you can see all the cones on this snarly guy, the uh, pitch pines and the oaks are doing much better than the uh, 
you know, handful of white pines. This pine strobus right here is a white pine that I've seen. You know, doing what you can with what you have. Uh, and if I didn't already say this, I mean, I know I said this. We're not, you know, we're, we're, we're talking single digits of feet above sea level here. Uh, pretty close to the shore. And, uh, yeah, let me stop. Let me stop yammering. Let's go see what else there is to see. But, yeah, this is not um, not what you would call rich, fertile soil. Uh, nor is it even really particularly boggy, if you if you think about it. Um, there's no floating mats of peat there. Just a minor accumulation of organic matter on that pond shore. So, um, we'll keep going. What you get here? Oh, you got Nora Banky. This is that, uh, oh geez, I forget the, I forget the gene. I, oh man, I know what plant this is. It's an Orobank KCA. I've seen this before. Still in bloom, huh? This is the, uh, uh, whatever. They call it narrow-leaved cow wheat, which is a, a stupid, I should, I wish I remembered the, uh, scientific name before I remembered the, um, I can look it up. Hang on one second. All right, I, I just looked at my, my own INAT observation of this from earlier in the summer. Melampyrum linear is the uh, name of this guy here. Orobankaceae is a family, a family pretty much composed of uh, nothing but parasitic plants. Um, some like Epiphagus virginiana are completely achlorophilous and parasitic, um, but unlike um, our, our famous achlorophilus friend monotropa uniflora it's not parasitizing um fungus it's not a mycoheterotroph it's parasitizing uh well that particular plant's parasitizing the roots of a of a vagus uh, grandifolia you know uh, beech trees or i think just trees in the genus vagus you get my point it's just parasitizing off of a plant uh so is this guy obviously this guy can still photosynthesize a bit on himself I, i'm just in love with the shape of the leaves we even call that the two horns on the side they're not, it's not sharp either. They just have those. Um, got the zygomorphic flower. Opposite leaves, of course, because remember, we're still dealing with Lamy Ailes here. This is in the order of mints, but it's in the family of uh, Orobankies, of, uh, of broom rapes, which is um, always raises an eyebrow when you say that out loud. But uh, great plant, really interesting flower structure, just small, kind of hard to look at. And those leaves get a little bit less of those spikes as you go down. Uh, cool plant coming up next to... Uh, Coming up next to Vaccinium, blueberry. So we're going to keep moving on. This was a treat. I didn't expect to see that. You got to love your parasitic plants. This guy's probably st probably stealing from the blueberries, but that's okay. Um, the blueberries are none worse the wear. Parasitism in the plant community. Plant on plant parasit parasitism rarely ever really seems to knock the host back too bad unless you start getting a comorbidity with drought or some other stressor. Um, even the microheterotrophs, so the fungus parasitizing plants, don't seem to really uh, knock their hosts back too much. And you just get the one of these guys here. Just one of them. Um, yeah, that's a cool treat. I'm inside of what looks like a, uh, what I can only imagine is a bird blind. You know, doesn't look like it's been maintained in a while. It's a little clethra right in front of us. In fact, this entire underbrush is all just freaking clethra. I see what looks like a species of Eupatorium down through. Let's go check this out. But, uh, yeah, weird little bird. I, I, I imagine this must be a bird blind. I'm surprised no one's taking a, no one's taking a dump in here. Man, as a guy who grew up in New Hampshire, all right, which I would not call remote by the uh, standards of the West Coast or the, you know, even the Midwest. You do get some relatively remote areas for, for the Northeast, which for all intents and purposes is a very, very uh, dense and populated region. You come down to Massachusetts, you go out to some of these conservation lands like this, and it's just so nice. I can hear the highway, and yet I'm about a half mile in to this little woodland area. No one's bothered me. No one was parked the little trailhead. No one was even on the road leading into this because you got a highway zipping by that way and then you've got Route 3 to Cape Cod zipping by the other way. And you just have these tiny little gems of conservation land, especially down here on Cape Cod, uh, where it's just incredibly botanically interesting. And what I mean to say is I just stumbled across a wonderful area. I don't even know where to begin, all right, with what's going on here. Because we got lots of good stuff. 
we got so much good stuff right here just on this little pond edge coming out of the uh that the, the outhouse bird blind there i just named that it's the outhouse bird blind um no i'm just kidding it's just a bit just a regular bird blind those aren't rare okay so we'll start here with this mutant looking dude here this was just a button bush this was um cephalanthus occidentalis it's done it's done now these are in full these were in full bloom last month probably smelled amazing to stand here and just gawk at it as it was doing its thing um you know ruby aca is the family of this guy coffee family done done for the season now uh these fruits will be maturing into the little beaked seeds you come and collect those i tried growing this i actually successfully grew a whole bunch of it and um the thing just it, it didn't make it you know i i killed the plant dragonflies everywhere plenty of nymphaea odorata out here across the pond um uh, oh, by the way, this button bush is the only thing kind of breaking up the cleffer party. You've actually got a, a really big, really, really big, almost arborescent vaccinium here. Vaccinium corymbosum. Uh, fruit's a little past ripe in the sun. You go in there, there's still some good blueberries to eat. Um, we we have that Sabathia, uh, Sabathia Kennediana here. You can see what that, what those, uh, remember? So now, now this one, this one's done. The anthers are all withered up. That uh, stigma is doing something interesting there. And pretty soon it'll be ma maturing into one of those fruits. I apologize the lighting's bad. Um, so we still had that gentian actually doing really, really well here. And then the next thing I noticed, these ones are in bloom. I saw these leaves and I'm like, hey, that looks familiar. And then I saw, what did I see? What did I see? I saw this and I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding me. And then sure enough, he doesn't look that hot. There's a few a few plants here. They're all kind of shrimpy. You've got uh, Rexia virginiana here. You've got a Melostomataceae. You've got Rubiaceae, Melostomataceae, Ericaceae from the blueberry with the hairy petals, the hairy stem. I didn't know that guy grew here. I wasn't expecting to see uh, a Melostomataceae here. How cool is that? I'm, 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 I'm dodging the obvious. You get this little aster here. I don't know what this, I don't know what this guy is. There's a few of these growing. I'll, I'll figure this out. And I might, come on, work with me here, buddy. Yeah, let's figure out what that is. I don't know what that is off to, offhand. Um, so you got Gentian ACA, Ruby ACA, Melastomataceae, Asteraceae, um, uh, Ericaceae, which I mean, you would expect to see Ericaceae uh, here. There's some more Gentians down that way. You get that uh, Euphrasia here again, looking a little bit better than the one from around the corner. And then, of course, <laughs> Doing extremely, extremely well, occupying this entire coastal pond shore here. You got our target plant for today, which to many probably just looks like a roadside weed, but to me, this is an incredibly fascinating plant. This is um, Eupatorium nova anglii right here, uh, endemic only to uh, basically the, the Cape Cod and then a little into Massachusetts. Literally known from, I kid you not. I think maybe a dozen ponds like this. Most of them are actually on private land. This is one of the few areas, I believe, where people are able to get access to it, if they even know it's here. It's a little off the beaten path. I had to come down that kind of overgrown bird blind trail. Um, no sign that said it was closed. No sign that said it was closed. Um, so we already talked about, I've talked plenty in other videos about button bush. Uh, we already gave that whole, um, we already gave that gentian a pretty thorough talking to it. It's a little beetle on me, but it's not a tick, so it's okay. Uh, Melostomataceae, this Rexia right here. Uh, Rexia only... So Melostomataceae is a predominantly... Tro I'll give you the brief. Melostomataceae is predominantly tropical. This genus, Rexia, is actually one of the few exceptions to that. It's only known from the East Coast of the United States. And I think the Caribbean um, got those eight really weird... Poros anthers there, buzz pollinated, bugs got to get up in there, buzz on them at the right frequency to get them to release the pollen. Um, those little filaments turn red once it's been uh, on its way out. Flowers only live for two days. Hairy, opposite leaves with those nice veins down to the bottom there. And uh, Rexia virginica, yeah, this guy's done. Rexia virginica, I think it's a little bit past their season anyway. Rexia virginica uh, does really, really well. I think that actually makes it all the way up to Canada. So this is the farthest north, essentially. 
that melastoma tasia is making. You also get Rexia mariana, which if you're from, you know, the mid-Atlantic states, subtropical states, you're probably much more familiar with, and they get a whole bunch from down in Florida. Get that out of the way. I already talked about that Euphrasia. Um, yeah, okay, let's let's get into it with this with this plant here, with this uh, Eupatorium. So Eupatoriae is the tribe that this is in. Same tribe as the Lyatris we were hoping to see. The Shooting Star, you know. Um, New England Bone Set, New England Thoroughwort is a name, is a couple names for this. And for the longest time, this plant was thought to be a relative of, um, or not a relative, a subspecies of another species of uh, Eupatorium, Eupatorium leucolepsis. All right. Eupatorium leucolepsis doesn't really make it up here. So it was a very treated as a variation. And then, of course, in the 90s, they did a genetic study on this. They actually looked at the DNA of this species. It's probably prettier to look at that. Look at it with the habitat light talk. They looked at the DNA of the species. They found out it's not related to, well, it is related. It's in the same genus, but not closely enough related to Eupatorium leucolepsis to warrant it being a subspecies of it. They proposed then that it was a hybrid of two other species, which I believe returned back a um, inconclusive result. All we know is that this species is male sterile, meaning that the um, male plants... Uh, the pollen these produce is infertile. Um, they're somehow self-reproducing, or not somehow. The fem females just they they can. Uh, it's not asexual. I I don't know what the term for it is. It does produce fertile seed though. Obviously, or not. I shouldn't say obviously. Why am I saying that? It can reproduce through the roots um, to an extent, and. On certain years, this plant will disappear. This is its entire habitat in the world. From the edge of basically the bank of the shore of your pond to the water, this strip on these dozen or so ponds down here is the only habitat this thing seems to be able to grow. Why is that? I don't know. You can't, I don't know if you can answer that question. Some years it disappears completely. Some years it doesn't come out at all. This year it's been so dry. It's having a very, very good year. Um, probably, presumably also lining other areas around this reservation. I think I see a nice big patch right over there. This is probably small compared to what it will do depending on where we go. And there's recruitment. I mean, you can see there's a baby one down there. So, it's a hybrid of other Eupatorium species that no longer grow sympatrically. They no longer grow together. Sympatric just means growing together. At some point, maybe in the last, you know, in the ice ages, they were growing together. Or maybe this plant had a much broader range. And then as a result of contraction, it's just become sterile. You can think of a whole bunch of different scenarios. But this species did basically didn't, presumably did not arise here. It presumably either had a much bigger range or at one point two species of Eupatorium were growing sympatrically with one another that enabled this hybrid to come out and, you know, propagate. But now whatever gene transfer was happening is not happening anymore. It's now a distinct species, Eupatorium nova anglii, restricted only to this area, endemic to the coast of far uh, southeast New England. Um, you can differentiate it between the common Eupatorium, the common bone uh uh, bone set um, just by the fact it doesn't have perfoliate leaves so those leaves don't surround the stem right we're dealing with true opposite leaves which is great if it would zoom in or focus I should say I shouldn't say zoom in I don't need to zoom in uh, serrations on those minutely hairy on the back minutely hairy on the stem uh, you get some other species of Eupatorium. I mean, Perfoliatum is an easy one. That's the common one. That's the one you're going to see most often. Again, this isn't perfoliate. The leaves on this are very narrow. Some of the other Eupatoriums that lack that perfoliate leaf structure have really fat, wide leaves. And I think a lot of them, you know, they just don't have um, that type of... The, the one that has linear leaves like this has smooth margins. And then the one that also has um, uh, dentate margins has a much fatter leaf. Um, I don't, Pelosum, I think, is another species you get, but I, I digress. I'm, you know, pretty confident that this is that. Let's take a look at those phyleries. It's supposed to have a little white tip up near the top. 
Oh yeah, you can get in there. You can see the little little tubular, five petaled florets in there. Uh, other species of Eupatorium also have many more of these capitula per head. This one's got relatively few. Stigmas hanging out of there. Harryfileries.com. I shouldn't say that. That's trademarked. Let's get the hairy fileries. I'm steal. I'm stealing from other YouTubers here. I'm stealing their material. I shouldn't do that. But uh, yeah, I got the hairy fileries, which are always a treat to see. And that's it right there. Eupatorium nova angliae, and a true blue New England endemic. Uh, probably restricted in range, only second to uh, Potentia rubinziana, which we also got to see. But um, just a treat, man. You wouldn't even know that this is a cool plant if you didn't understand the context of it, what it represents, the fact that there's a, there's a whole story, a whole story spanning tens of thousands of years, um, longer than longer than any human will have influence over the world. You know, 20,000 years, 40,000 years ago, this plant might not even have existed. Relatively recent upbringing, or maybe it did. Maybe it's just a, a paleo endemic in it once just had a much broader range. Who knows? Um, there's, there's a few papers, and I've, I think I've read most of the papers that have been published about this because there really aren't that many. Nothing of traditional medical use. It's not showy. It's not growing in a far-off exotic land. We're 20 minutes from Boston here. But this this stuff is in your backyard, man. You've got to come out. You've got to come out and start looking at the stuff around you because it'll blow your mind, you know? Famous uh, botanists, well-known botanists, you know, people who do this stuff for a living, they might not even have even heard of this plant. There's like five papers on it, maybe four. One of them is from like the 1940s. Some guy came out to every single population for like three years and counted all of them. And every single paper that I found published, I mean, I found a couple papers from the 90s, etc., uh, all reference that original paper. I don't think this is a very well-studied plant, to be frank. Uh, and they, they do actually tell you it's right here. What they say is it's rare. It is globally endangered because it's so rare. Um, so is the so is that gentian, too. Um, a Sabatia kennediana that we were looking at. But come on, man. You got to appreciate the little things in life. That's such a cool story. Who knows? You let your imagination go wild. All right, I'm going to take some pics of this habitat. I'm going to try and figure out what that other little aster down below me was, see if that was anything interesting. And if not, we'll just do the little loop around here. We'll hike out of here. We'll call it a day. I'll see if there's anything else interesting. But I think I've already got, like, over a half hour material. Okay, this little, this little guy right here. i got to get up out of here. My phone's dying. A little symbiote trick on that's what this was. It was driving me nuts. I'm like, oh, what, what about the off chance? This is something interesting. This is a salt marsh symbiote trick on. And it was more fun figuring out what it was. You get those little florets in there, daisy rays, unlike our uh, Eupatorium next to me. Uh, you know, what was interesting is they said, look at the, you always get to look at the bracts with the sunflowers. Oh, they said those little purple tipped bracts. Give it away. Pretty nice, if you ask me. So, yes, yeah, Scipio trichum tenuifolium. See, got the little lance shaped leaves. Same family as uh, Scipio trichum nova anglii. Gotta love the Nova Anglii plants. Still rocking the uh, five-lobed uh, fuse coral there. Pretty, pretty much uh, a standard for a lot of the asters. And I don't even think I mentioned. Yeah, this is in the Eupatoria tribe. The uh, you, you see, he's got the he's got the five lobes in there too. Remember, just these are capitulum, capitula. Florals, capitula, singulars, capitulum. It's clusters of smaller flowers appearing to be one big flower. A uh, Eupatoria. No daisy rays in it. Pretty much anything in this in this uh, tribe, I don't believe. And then the uh, same tribe as the uh, Liatris nova anglii, which we're gonna hope to see before you know before the season's over. Um, you also get Eutrochium in that tribe too, which I think I've said in a video before. So the Joe Pie weeds are also. Close relatives of this guy, too. Lots of cool plants in Eupatoria. Anyway, we spent enough time. Enough time, but not enough time, because there'll never be enough time down on this bank. I'm going to go check out that. What looks like another population around the bend there. And if we don't see anything else interesting, we'll get on up out of here. But yeah, that was a little Symphio trickum down there. Well, I hike all the way over here. And uh, didn't even end up where I thought I would end up. That was one of the most horrific experiences of my life. Everything behind me, 
it's just an impenetrable wall of uh, brambles. But over here, uh, we still get that. Uh, was I saying Euphrasia? I think I meant Euthamia. If I was saying Euthamia, Euphrasia before, that's not this is Euthamia, Carolinia. We got some pipe warts down there. Don't really know much about pipe warts other than that's what those are. Nice aquatic plant. A uh, couple individuals of a uh, the um, the jeez, uh, I'm gonna Eupatorium nova anglia here. Not nearly as many as over where we were, and not as many as where I was trying to get to. Let me also get this thing down here, which I'm uh, I'm gonna figure out what this is. This could be. I almost wonder if this is one of those. Uh, Lind Lindernias. All right, so this plant I got completely screwed up on and while I was filming the video, this is something called Gradiola aria. It's golden hedge hesop is the common name. This is actually an indicator species for Eupatorium nova angliae. The two frequently grow together. It's another one of those weird disjuncts between mostly Nova Scotia and New England. You also get it in New Jersey, and I think in a couple of locations around the Great Lakes, but overall relatively restricted. And on that note, we're gonna end the video. Have a great day.